Pastor Lizzie comes to the stage. <laughs> Oh, you got to love it, don't you? Um, my wife is, uh, we often laugh, she often mixes her metaphors. So it's all, you know, it's all um, bells and roundabouts and swings and whistles. And um, <coughs> So I guess if it happens in metaphors, it happens in sermon titles. How funny was that? So, uh, you know, happiness is a road trip. It is true. It's very true. But it's also an inside job. So good morning, everybody. Good to see you all. Thank you to our worship team today. The silence was deafening. Come on. Thank you to our worship team. Great job. <clears throat> they serve us. They serve us continually. They, they're in here at 7 o'clock in the morning, practicing, rehearsing, ready just to help create an environment that we can all enjoy. So continue to appreciate it and uh, appreciate them. Wonderful, but not just them, everyone else who serves each day. And can I just encourage you, if you want to be a part of helping this church to breathe and grow, become a part of a team, um, one of the team. We'd love to have you serve somewhere, and uh, that enables the church to grow. You know, the church was never meant to be a, uh, a Boeing 7, 747, 737 or whatever, with, uh, you know, a bunch of people sitting down, two or three people running around going mad trying to serve them all. No, the church... Church is the church, it's the body, right? And uh, so let's all be a part of helping that. Wonderful. Well, it is good to be here this morning and uh, we're going to continue on our series. Happiness is... <laughs> we'll change it next week to road trip. Uh, happiness is an inside job. And, uh, you know, for most people, happiness is based on happenings. If things are happening according to what will make me happy, well, you know, like kind of when and then thinking, when that happens, then I'll be happy. Well, Jesus' first sermon, um, he knew that people were looking for happiness. And how many of you made a bad decision around something that you thought would lead to happiness? In searching for happiness, something that would make us happy, we, we can make some bad decisions. And, and Jesus knew that people ultimately were looking for something called happiness. And the very first sermon he ever preached, he actually speaks into that. And it's called the Sermon on the Mount. And the particular part we're talking about is the Beatitudes, and, um, and so that word there where he starts in each of the verses where he says, blessed, blessed are the, blessed are the, that word blessed means a deep inner satisfaction. Who wants a bit of that? A deep inner satisfaction and it also means happiness. And so happiness is an inside job, not when and then. So let's read, let's, let's get the ball rolling by reading that section again. It's Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 to 10. Here we go. Now, when he saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside and he sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are those, but sorry, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And uh, we've been through most of those. Today is number seven of the eight. And there's so many rich thoughts that come to me as I read through those simple verses. And I would encourage you to go back, if you've missed any of those, if you can go back and have a look on uh, our YouTube, you can, you can see each of those and revisit each of those. But today, we're going to go to the seventh, which is, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Come on, say it with me. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And that verse, the NIV says children of God. That, that makes it a bit further across the board, doesn't it? Blessed are those... Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. It's amazing um, how many traits, you, whether we like it or not, whether it's good or bad, it's amazing how many traits we do pick up often from our parents. And, uh, you know, often you know, people, people say to you, you're just like your father or you're just like your mother, and usually it's kind of not a positive thing. Um, <laughs> People are thinking of moments. 
And uh, I guess in our home, it's, it's often the case, you know, when, when uh, our kids decided to tidy up their room and vacuum the carpet and put things away and, you know, just be proactive in helping around the house, Nikki would always say, those kids, they're just like their father. <laughs> boom, boom. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> But the fact is, when we are peacemakers, we become just like our Heavenly Father. We are just like our Father when we are peacemakers. And boy, does this world need some peacemakers at the moment. And so this, you know, it's possible today to take this whole idea of peacemaking and just point it outward at, you know, we think of situations and big conflicts in the world and things that are happening in world events. But today, it's really important that we understand that peacemaking starts in here. Happiness is an inside job. Peacemaking, firstly, is an inside job. It's got to start in here. And so many of the conflicts that we have that go on around us, it's because for the simple reason we don't have peace in here. So it starts in here. So let's let's get into it. What's a peacemaker? Peacemaker literally means, here it means to join to become one, to reconcile. To join, become one, and to reconcile. Notice it says, uh, it doesn't doesn't say, blessed are the peace lovers. Everyone loves a bit of peace, right? We all love peace. And it doesn't say, blessed are the peaceable, kind of like, you know, whatever happens around me, well, nothing's going to disturb my peace. Kind of like, that's the peaceable. But it says, blessed are the peace, what? Makers. And this is what it means, one, who actively seeks to resolve conflict. One who actively seeks to resolve conflict. So firstly, just, I think we need to say this. Let me just tell you what it's not. Um, a peacemaker doesn't mean, that, it, it doesn't mean avoiding problems. It doesn't mean running from problems. It doesn't mean pretending. No, nothing to see here. Everything's just all okay. And it's kind of like trying to hold the proverbial balls underneath the water in the pool, you know, until you let it go and they all pop up again, right? It's kind of like, you know, unresolved conflict is a little bit like white ants. Eventually, it's going to bring the house down. All right, so it's not avoiding conflict or problems. Uh, It's also not appeasing somebody just for the sake of peace. You know, I give up, I give up, just have it all your way. I'm dominated, just walk in, walk all over me. It doesn't mean that at all because the result of appeasement is resentment. And resentment builds and builds and builds until it explodes. And we have a classic example of that that we're watching unfold before our eyes today, right? In the Middle East. It's just been resentment has built up. It also doesn't mean it's a truce. A truce. You see, uh, you know, a truce is not, this, peacemaking is not talking about a truce. A truce is just, you know, a truce is I'm going to lay down my, gun, my guns and I'm going to stop shooting just so I can reload. That's not, that's not peacemaking. So where does this peace come from? What, what is this peace and how do I bring that peace? How do I become a peacemaker? So firstly, where does it come from? Well, the origin of peace is God. We have to understand this. He's the source of peace. Um, Because it says, peacemakers shall be called children of God. Why? Because we're just like Him. See, that's where peace originates from. Peace comes from God. God is at peace with Himself. I love this idea that He's the Father, He's the Son, He's the Holy Spirit. God the Father, God the Son, Holy Spirit. And they live together in perfect harmony and unity. God is at peace with Himself. They're not at war with each other. Um, you know, they're not trying to, they're not falling out with each other all the time. Aren't you glad that God is at peace with himself? He is one in three. So peace originates from God. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 talks about being the God of peace. Isaiah speaks about um, Jesus being the Prince of Peace. John 6.33, you can write these down. I'm just saying them quickly. He says, I've told you these things so that in me you might, in me you might have peace. Galatians 5.22 says the fruit of the Spirit is peace. John chapter 14, verse 27, Jesus said, My peace I give 
to you. Are you hearing this today? Peace is something that comes from God. It originates in God and it comes from God. So peace is not the absence of something, it's the presence of something. Okay, peace is not the absence of something, it's the presence of something. So what is the peace that Christ gives us? Well, let's cut straight to the chase. In one word, the peace that Christ gives us is righteousness. Righteousness. Righteousness means holy, innocent, that which is together. Right? In other words, um, He makes us whole. He makes us holy. He makes us innocent before God. And where there is peace, you will find righteousness. And where there is righteousness, you will find peace. There's a great scripture, I think, I think it's a beautiful picture. I love this. Uh, Psalm 85 and verse 10. Look at what it says. It says, Love and faithfulness meet together. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Don't you love that imagery? I- imagery? Imag- that's the word. Righteousness and peace kiss each other or have kissed each other. There's an inseparable link between righteousness and peace. In fact, let me give you one more. James chapter 3, verse 18 says, Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Who can see those links right through? So how then do I become a peacemaker? Because peace originates in God, and God is holy, And so when Jesus said, my peace I give to you, he's literally saying, I'm giving you my righteousness, I'm giving you my holiness. Yeah? So how do I become truly like my heavenly Father? How do I become a peacemaker? Well, the very first thing is obvious, we have to make peace with God yourself. It starts with making your own peace with God. In other words, it's an inside job. It starts on the inside. And that means, and if you're going to make peace with God, let's back up just a little bit, you have to understand and, and see today that you are not at peace with God. In fact, it gets worse with that, worse than just that. Romans chapter 8 and verse 7 says this, says, For the carnal mind is what? Enmity against God. What's that saying? It's saying our natural state, our unredeemed self, is naturally at war. We are enemies. We are naturally at war against God. And we have to understand that. Though. That's, that's the starting point. That's where it begins. And, and it's kind of like, hey, you want proof? that our, in our natural state that we are at war with God, the only time, the only time ever that God made himself vulnerable, that God made himself um, vulnerable to you and I, what did we do to him? We killed him. So we in our natural state are enemies of God. And it might be hidden, It might be deep, it might be sleeping, but when things don't go well for us, when our expectations in life are not fulfilled, enmity against God is awakened. That's why when something bad happens, they call it an act of God. And it shows itself, it reveals itself in our mind, the things that we start to think. It reveals itself in our will. Our will's being crossed by God. How many of you know that's an, on, that's an ongoing battle? And our emotions, we are cold against God. We're unmoved. It's interesting that, you know, when Jesus died on the cross, the very earth and the rocks were split in two, but we can look at the cross and be totally unmoved by it. 
So until you see your, your, at, your natural state is at enmity, is hostile towards God, you'll never be at peace with him. See, when, he, when, when we killed him, I, and I use the proverbial we, us, humanity, when we killed him, he took the punishment I deserved for my rebellion against God, right? And when we recognize that our punishment has been taken away, he took it all, God can now send his Holy Spirit to live in us and his Holy Spirit living in us begins to change our minds, our will and our emotions towards him. That's why the Holy Spirit's job is to convict us of sin and righteousness. But if you think about that event, well, the cross itself was anything but peaceful. The cross was brutal. The cross was horrific. The cross was bloody. Why so? Because that was sin being dealt with. That was sin being dealt with by God. Sin always leads to a loss of peace and conflict. Always. When I, when I follow the path of sin, it will always lead to conflict. It will always lead to a loss of peace. And it's only when our sin is dealt with, it's only when our sin was dealt with, and it was on that cross, and it was bloody, but of course, Jesus himself, who knew no sin, became sin for us, so sin couldn't hold him, and the price for sin was paid in full, and we know that because Jesus was resurrected from the dead. Are you with me? Okay. He rose from the dead, and now because of that, because of his payment of sin on my behalf, it was my punishment was all in him. Now because of that, we can have peace with God. We can now have peace with God. And the Bible says he literally gives you his righteousness. And I love, love this scripture, 2 Corinthians 5.21, which says, it's probably one of my favorite scriptures, it says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. He became rape, he became murder, he became adultery, he became violence, he became in the sight of God, and, it said, and the, the wrath of God was poured out on the Son. He who knew no sin became sin for us so that in Him, in Him, it, us in Him, that we might become the righteousness of God. That's called the great exchange. We've got about as much hope as making our own righteousness as we do as making our own peace. And that's why it has to come from God. It's my peace I give you. <clears throat> so peace is not the absence of something, it's the presence of something. It's the presence of righteousness. Who can see that this morning? I'm good with God. And so many of our battles we go through in life over a lack of our own peace inside with God and not understanding that we are the righteousness of Christ and living, seeking to live a righteous life. So how do I become a peacemaker? Number one, you find your own peace with God. How do we do that? By accepting His righteousness as a gift for yourself. Who's with me this morning? Who's received that gift this morning? Come on, just thank you for a moment for the gift of righteousness. Father, we thank you. We take it for granted. We get used to it. We, we live with it. We, we, you know, some of you have been saved so long that you've forgotten what it's like to be unsaved. And this morning, remind yourself that you are the righteousness of Christ. And, and your righteousness is not something that you earned. It was a gift of God. And as a result of His Holy Spirit working within us, the, the thing, that part of me that wants to rebel against God, the Holy Spirit brings to my attention, and I become my mind, my will, and my emotions start to become more loving and pleasing God. Come on, church. You've got to receive the gift of righteousness. So you've got to make your peace with God. Then... 
to become a peacemaker. It starts with you. Then we help others make their peace with God. We help others make their peace with God. This is, this is, actually, this is actually now our new direction in life. I've got no purpose in life. Yes, you do. It's to help others make peace with God. That's what we're called to do. This is our new purpose. This is our reason for being. As a church, this is a reason why we exist as a church. One, we are people who have experienced the peace of God and we are receivers of the gift of righteousness and now we help others find the peace of God. That's what we live for. That's what we, 2 Corinthians 5.18, it says it so clearly. It says, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and he has now given us, tell a person, that'd be you. Tell someone on the other side of you, that'd be you. He's given us the ministry. I don't have a ministry, Pastor. Yes, you do. We all have it. It's called the ministry of reconciliation, of reconcil- helping others to be reconciled to make their peace with God. That's our job. That's what we do to join, to bring together, to reconcile. And that's why, as Christian people, we build bridges and not walls. I grew up in the day where we separated ourselves and we were so separate there was no bridge for an unbeliever to get near us. Let me tell you, as a church, it's possible to live just our little parallel world in here. And that's why, as a church, our job is to build bridges and not walls with people in the community. Why? Because our job is to be peacemakers. Our job, you see, that's why we have, a, coming up in a few weeks' time, we have our Christmas festival. And we can go, oh, you, you know, that's their thing, few people, whatever. What's it all about? The Christmas festival, let me tell you why it exists. Why we do it? It's because we're seeking to build bridges with people and not walls. We're seeking to open the front door. We're seeking to build relationship and bridges with people so that, so that one day, hopefully, we can help them make their peace with God. That's what it's for. You see, we have to understand that for people to make their peace with God, it's not an event, it's a process. And the event is a part of the process. Who sees that this morning? And so when people go, well, you know, um, you know, I, I have no interest in that. How could you not? How could you not want that to succeed so well? Because it's an opportunity to help. See, I can build, I could, on my own, I've got to build bridges with other people. And we'll talk about that one in a moment. I have to build my own bridges. And on my own, I can probably build, you know, a, a reasonable little bridge. But how many know I'm never going to build a big bridge? The only way you build a big bridge is as you work together. And so the church comes together and we do an event that builds a big bridge. And just maybe, just maybe, there's some people that are going to walk across that bridge one day and find their peace with God as a result of the bridge that we have built as a church. So come on, church. Let's, let's make it a fantastic event. Jump on board, roll up our sleeves, and let's say, hey, let's build an incredible bridge. That's why Christmas is a great opportunity because Jesus was announced by the angels as said, peace on earth and goodwill to all men. How many of you want to reach the all men, all people? Well, as a church, we need to build a big bridge. And we build lots of bridges in this church. And we can go around and name them all. But let me tell you, the Christmas festival is a bridge to our community. And why are we doing it? Because we've got nothing better to do. Why do we actually invest in it? Well, if we get a revelation that our new purpose in life, a peacemaking, is peacemaking, we will roll up our steves, get involved, and make it the best event we possibly can. Can I hear a good amen? Why? Because our job is to lead others to make peace with God. So number one, if we're going to be peacemakers, oh, by the way, and when we do that, we are, just be, we are being just like our Father. When He sees us doing things like that, when we are intentionally building bridges with people, our Father in heaven goes, that's my boy. That's my girl. We're just like Him. So, how do we become peacemakers? 
you make your own peace with God. Number two, you help others make their peace with God. Are you with me so far? And then number three, you make peace with each other. Oh. <laughs> Dang, we're doing well. It was just kind of like, you know, I'm glad that I can make my peace with God. Boy, am I glad I can make my peace with God. And yeah, I can probably come along and do a little bit to help build a bridge with others. But you mean I've got to make peace with others? Yes. Yes. So I'm going to give you the abbreviated version. There's a longer version to this. So I've just picked out what I think is the key, the key thoughts. The abbreviated version. But let's just take the word peace. And you go, here's how you can make peace with others. Okay, the word. P-E-A-C-E. -E. Number one, P. You've got to plan a peace talk. You've got to plan a peace talk. Matthew 5 and verse 24 says, If you have something against someone, go to what? Them before you offer your gift. Matthew, Matthew 18 says, If you've got something against your brother or your sister, go to them. Okay, so you've got to actually take some proactive steps. Let me tell you, if you have conflict and it, it, it is not going to resolve itself, how many of you know that Jesus was proactive? He went to the problem, right? It's not going to restore itself. It won't restore itself by accident. We have to take peace steps. Listen to me carefully. The ball is always in your court. Always in your court. So go to them. What we do instead is we go to everyone else. If the church would only abide by that Matthew 18 principle, if you have a problem with someone, go to them. And then if you don't have any, then go and get some help. But instead what we do is we've got a problem with someone, so we go to everyone else but them. Chickens. Chicken. So if we do that, how many know when we do that, we give the devil a huge foothold? Satan moves through open wounds. So first thing we do is God, as, as peacemakers, if we want to be like our Father in heaven, we, we plan a peace talk. Number two, E, we empathize with them. Someone once said, don't try to under... If you want to... I'm trying to work out... Seek first to understand and then be understood. Seek first to understand and then be understood. But you know what? When we've got a problem, what do we want? We just want to be understood, right? Come on, listen. You're not hearing me. If we can first seek first to understand and then think about being understood. You see, Romans chapter 15 and verse 2 in the Living Bible basically says, puts it this way. It says, we must bear the burdens of being considerate of the doubts and fears of others. We must bear the burden Wrong scripture, don't worry about putting it up. You can, you can check it out yourself. Um, Romans 15 and verse 2. And I'm reading from the, the Living Bible translation, but it, it's the gist of it. It says, if we, we must bear the burden of being considerate of the doubts and fears of others. Ro uh, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 4 says, um, look known to your own interests, but to the interests of others. How many of you think that's a good scripture? They're all pretty good, aren't they? <laughs> so even if you think their doubts are unjustified, even if you think that their fear is irrational, even if you think that their interest is not important at all, my Bible says to consider the needs of others. And the word consider is scopos. It's like with a, tell us, with a sight on your gun. You kind of, you, you know, you, you zoom in on it and you first seek to be understood, sorry, seek first to understand and then be understood. Did you get that? Okay, it's abbreviation version, so I'll move on. So P-E-A, A is attack the problem, not the person. <clears throat> attack the problem, not the person. Otherwise, it just becomes adversarial. 
our politics have an adversarial system. And how many know that adversarial system often leads to personal attack rather than the problem? And we all sit back and watch and we go, would you please stop attacking each other and just sort out the problem? Well, guess what? There are people who have watched you and I and gone, would you please stop attacking each other and sort out the problem? So we attack the problem, not the person. And when we do that, we say, hey, I'm jumping in the trench and the problem's out there and together we are going to fight it. Are you with me this morning? Attack the problem, not the person. P-E-A, what's next? C, cooperate as much as possible. Romans chapter 12 and verse 18. Romans 12, 18. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with... Who's everyone? Everyone. As much as it is possible. Can I just say it's... Sometimes it's not possible to live with peace with someone. And that comes back to the things that I said earlier about what peace, being a peacemaker, isn't. However, it's an abbreviated version. But as much as possible, live at peace with all people. You see, let me make a statement. It does need qualifying. Don't have time to qualify it. But most relationship breakdowns come from inflexibility more than from adultery or money or anything else because we're unwilling to change. We're not willing to cooperate. How often do you hear about people splitting on? They say, well, we're just not compatible. We're incompatible. Someone once said, well, he doesn't have the income and she's not compatible. Well, I don't know. Anyway, you work that one out. But we're just incompatible. <laughs> Bottom line is we're unwilling to change. So cooperate as much as possible. And then the last one is E, which is emphasize, this is so important, emphasize reconciliation over resolution. Reconciliation, to reconcile, means to reestablish relationship. Relationship resumed. Resolution is to resolve every issue. And here's what I, here's again, abbreviated version. Here's how I boil it down. We value relationship over issues. We value relationship over issues. Let's bring it to church for a moment. I watch sometimes with people, they're so issue focused. They're always waiting and looking. They're like a, a cat ready to pounce on a mouse, just waiting for an issue to pounce on. It tells me that person is, values issues over relationship. And does it mean we never have issues to discuss? Absolutely not. But we are relationship-oriented, not issue-oriented. You hear me? Because that's what a peacemaker does. I could divide this church very quickly. Seriously? I could have you at each other's throats very quickly. Not because you're bad people, but because I could get you focusing on issues rather than relationship. You can apply that to any sphere in life. That's why... If someone wants to become a partner in this church and we partner around a common set of beliefs and purpose together, a mission together. But the start of our, as a preamble to our statement of beliefs, I have this little statement that says this, it says, in, the, in, in essentials, we have unity. One spirit, one baptism, one Lord, one faith. In essentials, we have absolute unity. In non-essentials, we have liberty. How many know there's a whole lot in church life that are non-essentials, but we can actually die on that battlefield? We can die on the battlefield of a non-essential. 
On the ascent, some people want to make everything an essential. Okay, color of the carpet, it's got to be blue. I'm going to die on that field. The volume, in, and in there, I won't even go there. Are you with me this morning? In the essentials, we have unity. In the non-essentials, we have liberty. And in all of our beliefs, we show charity. We show charity. If I have all the wisdom of the world, and of, of, the, of, the, of the ages, and if I speak in tongues of angels, but I have not love, I'm a big fat zero. I'm nothing. So that's why, and we have that, because we value relationship over resolution. You hear me this morning? So that's how you can be a peacemaker. Plan a peace talk. Empathize. Understand. Attack the problem, not the person. Cooperate as much as possible. And emphasize reconciliation over resolution. And do you know what? Can I have the band up, please? You know what? When we do that, listen to me carefully, we are being just like our Father. How many of you found that helpful this morning? Come on. Make your peace with God. Help others make peace with God. And you make peace with others. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall become, what? Children of God. Who wants to be a peacemaker this morning? Five of you? Great. Gloves on in the foyer. What did you learn at church this morning? Oh, I learned how to duck and weave. <laughs> you know, peacemaking is an intentional thing that we go about. But uh, there's a number of key factors out of that this morning. But one of them that jumps out to me is that actually is our new purpose and direction in life. We are peacemakers. You know, people often want me to make statements about everything in the church and everything that's going on in our world. And there is a time for that. Hear me, hear me, hear me. There is a time for that. But listen, I'm about being a peacemaker. I'm not going to die on the battlefield of my faith over every issue that the... Of course, of course they're going to they're gonna create things in our world. What, why are we surprised when sinners sin? What makes a sinner a sinner? They sin. So why are we surprised when they try and create laws and cultures that fit that. And I don't want to be known as a church about what we're, what, what, we, what we're against. I want to be known as a church about what we're for. Because so quickly we can make ourselves irrelevant and sidelined. You know, the, the Pharisees often ask Jesus, I don't know why I'm going down here, but I need to just for a moment. The Pharisees often ask Jesus questions and he was silent. And that tells me something. Some questions we should never answer depending on who's asking them and why. And that's why as a church, we want, to, we want to get on with the business of being peacemakers, building bridges, not walls, helping people find their own peace with God. Are you with me in that church? Come on, let's all stand to our feet. So this morning we hold in our hands the emblems that represent communion. And I guess so before we take it together, I wonder if there's anyone here this morning you need to make your peace with God. You see, I said earlier that we are natural, in a natural state, we are enemies of God. You might never, never thought of yourself like that before and you go, well, that's not me but it lies dormant in every one of us. Right circumstances and it'll rise up. As I said earlier, the, the only time God made himself vulnerable to us, God in the flesh, what did we do to him? We killed him.
And so I, before we have communion together, and look, every one of us, most of us here this morning, have at some stage said, Jesus, I need to make my peace with you. And I want to give you that opportunity to join with us all this morning. And you can have communion this morning. And it can mean something totally fresh and something totally new to you today. Recognize that your peace with God. It was your, because of the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, you can be good with God. You cannot create your own righteousness. If we could create our own righteousness, our own right standing with God just by balancing the books, Jesus wouldn't have had to die on the cross. The only reason he died on the cross was because the only way we could have a right relationship with, with God was through his own death on that cross for us. The perfect life that he lived offered up to him. So I hope you're thrilled this morning and you're surrounded by people that would also be absolutely thrilled today. If you said, hey, Russell, I want to make my peace with God. I want to put my head on the pillow and know that I'm good with God. And when you do that, you can know what it is to have peace in here. So before we have communion, while every head's bowed, every eye's closed, I wonder if there's someone here this morning who says, Russell, that's me. I need to make my peace with God. I want Jesus, the Prince of Peace, to come in and bring peace to my troubled soul this morning. And if that's you, just simply raise your hand. Just say, Russell, that's me. I'm going to pray a prayer in a moment and I'm going to invite the whole church to pray with us. But I want this prayer to be specifically for you. Yeah, fantastic. I see that hand. Anyone else this morning says, Jesus, I need to make my peace with you. Yeah, fantastic. I see that hand. Any other hands say, yeah, that's awesome. I see that hand over there. Anyone else? I need to make my peace with God. I haven't made my, I need to make my peace with God. Whether it's for the first time or whether it's a recommitment, is anyone else? I need to make my peace with God. I need His righteousness today. Anybody looking across? Yeah, fantastic. I see that hand. That's awesome. number of people wanting to make their peace right. Is there anyone else that wants to say, yes, I want to make my peace with God? I want to make my peace with God. I want the whole church to join with me this morning. And it's a prayer of inviting Jesus into our life and giving us peace in our heart. So church, I want you to join with these people that have raised their hands. But those who've raised their hands specifically, I want you to make this prayer your own this morning. Would everybody join with me? Big voice. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe in you. I believe that you lived, that you died, but you rose again, that I might be forgiven that I might have peace with God. And so, Jesus, I ask you for your peace. I ask you for your righteousness. Would you please come into my heart? Would you make me right with God the Father today? I thank you that you are my Saviour. I thank you that you are my peace and that you are my righteousness. Amen. And amen. Amen. Come on, give God an acclamation of praise this morning. Come on, just thank Him for a moment. I know it's hard to clap when you've got communion in your hand, right? That's all right. We'll save it till later. Come on, we're going to eat together. Represents His body. Come on, let's drink, eat together. Recognizing, just don't, don't just rush on, just for a moment. Just recognize the fact of that body. That was peace with God being made in that body. Thank you, Jesus. See it for a moment. Broken, bloodied. Thank you, Jesus. Now take this cup which represents his blood. Come on, drink it together, church. Now come on, begin to thank him. Thank him for your peace. Thank you for the peace that he gives. Thank him for his righteousness. Come on, let's let your own ears hear your own voice this morning. Speak it out this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. What a powerful name it is. Then 